Atkinson and Hilgard's Introduction to Psychology. Nature Nurture Debate. The roots of psychology can be traced to the great philosophers of ancient Greece. The most famous of them, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle posed fundamental questions about mental life, what is consciousness? Are people inherently rational or irrational? Is there really such a thing as a free choice? These questions and many similar ones are as important today as they were thousands of years ago. They deal with the nature of the mind and mental processes, which are the key elements of the cognitive perspective in psychology. Other psychological questions deal with the nature of the body and human behavior, and they have an equally long history. Hippocrates, often, called the father of medicine, lived around the same time as Socrates. He was deeply interested in physiology, the study of the functions of the living organism and its parts. He made many important observations about how the brain controls various organs of the body. These observations set the stage for what became the biological perspective in psychology. One of the earliest debates about human psychology is still raging today. This nature-nurture debate centers on the question of whether human capabilities are inborn or acquired through experience. The nature view holds that human beings enter the world with an inborn store of knowledge and an understand of reality. Early philosophers believed that this knowledge and understanding could be accessed through careful reasoning and introspection. In the 17th century, Descartes supported the nature view by arguing that some ideas, such as God, the self, geometric axioms, perfection, and infinity, are innate. Descartes is also notable for his conception of the body as a machine that can be studied much as other machines are studied. This is the root of modern information processing perspectives on the mind, discussed later in this chapter. The nurture view holds that knowledge is acquired through experiences and interactions with the world. Although some of the early Greek philosophers had this opinion, it is most strongly associated with the 17th century English philosopher John Locke. According to Locke, at birth, the human mind is a tabula rasa, a blank slate on which experience writes knowledge and understanding as the individual matures. This perspective gave birth to associationist psychology. Associationists denied that there were inborn ideas or capabilities. Instead, they argued that the mind is filled with ideas that enter by way of the senses and then become associated through principles such as similarity and contrast. Current research on memory and learning is related to early association theory. The classic nature-nurture debate has become much more nuanced in recent decades. Although some psychologists still argue that human thought and behavior result primarily from biology or primarily from experience, most psychologists take a more integrated approach. They acknowledge that biological processes, such as heredity or processes in the brain, affect thoughts, feelings, and behavior, but say that experience leaves its mark, too. So the current question is not whether nature or nurture shapes human psychology but rather how nature and nurture combine to do so, Plowman and Asbury, 2005. Nature-nurture issue comes up at numerous points in later chapters. The beginnings of scientific psychology Although philosophers and scholars continue to be interested in the functioning of both the mind and the body through the centuries, scientific psychology is usually considered to have begun in the late 19th century, when Wilhelm Wundt established the first psychological laboratory at the University of Leipzig in Germany in 1879. The impetus for the establishment of Wundt's lab was the belief that mind and behavior, like planets or chemicals, or human organs, could be the subject of scientific analysis. Wundt's own research was concerned primarily with the senses, especially vision, but he and his co-workers also studied attention, emotion, and memory. Wundt relied on introspection to study mental processes. Introspection refers to observing and recording the nature of one's own perceptions, thoughts, and feelings. Examples of introspections include people's reports of how heavy they perceive an object to be and how bright a flash of light seems to be. The introspective method was inherited from philosophy, but Wundt added a new dimension to the concept. Pure self-observation was not sufficient, it had to be supplemented by experiments. Wundt's experiments systematically varied some physical dimensions of a stimulus, such as its intensity, and used the introspective method to determine how these physical changes modify the participant's conscious experience of the stimulus. The reliance on introspection, particularly for very rapid mental events, proved unworkable. Even after extensive training, different people produced very different introspections about simple sensory experiences, and few conclusions could be drawn from these differences. As a result, introspection is not a central part of the current cognitive perspective. And, as we will see, some psychologists' reactions to introspection played a role in the development of other modern perspectives. Structuralism and Functionalism During the 19th century, chemistry and physics made great advances by analyzing complex compounds, molecules, into their elements atoms. 
These successes encourage psychologists to look for the mental elements that combine to create more complex experiences. Just as chemists analyzed water into hydrogen and oxygen, perhaps psychologists could analyze the taste of lemonade, perception, into elements such as sweet, bitter, and cold, sensations. The leading proponent of this approach in the United States was E.B. Titchener, a Cornell University psychologist who had been trained by Wundt. Titchener introduced the term structuralism the analysis of mental structures to describe this branch of psychology. But some psychologists suppose the purely analytic nature of structuralism. William James, the distinguished psychologist at Harvard University, felt that analyzing the elements of consciousness was less important than understanding its fluid, personal nature. His approach was named functionalism, studying how the mind works to enable an organism to adapt to an functionalist environment. 19th century psychologists' interest in adaptation stemmed from the publication of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Some argued that consciousness had evolved only because it served some purpose in guiding the individual's activities. To find out how an organism adapts to its environment, functionalists said that psychologists must observe actual behavior. However, both structuralists and functionalists still regarded psychology as the science of conscious experience. Behaviorism Structuralism and functionalism played important roles in the early development of 20th century psychology. Because each viewpoint provided a systematic approach to the field, they were considered competing schools of psychology. By 1920, however, both were being displaced by three newer schools, behaviorism, gestalt psychology, and psychoanalysis. Of the three, behaviorism had the greatest influence on scientific psychology in North America. Its founder, John B. Watson, reacted against the view that conscious experience was the province of psychology. Watson made no assertions about consciousness when he studied the behavior of animals and infants. He decided not only that animal psychology and child psychology could stand on their own as sciences but also that they set a pattern that adult psychology might follow. For psychology to be a science, Watson believed, psychological data must be open to public inspection like the data of any other science. Behavior is public, consciousness is private. Science should deal only with public facts. Because psychologists were growing impatient with introspection, the new behaviorism caught on rapidly, and many younger psychologists in the United States called themselves behaviorists. The Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov's research on the conditioned response was regarded as an important area of behavioral research, but it was Watson who was responsible for behaviorism's widespread influence. Watson, and others ascribing to behaviorism, argued that nearly all behavior is a result of conditioning, and the environment shapes behavior by reinforcing specific habits. For example, giving children cookies to stop them from whining reinforces, rewards, the habit of whining. The conditioned response was viewed as the smallest unit of behavior, from which more complicated behaviors could be created. All types of complex behavior patterns coming from special training or education were regarded as nothing more than an interlinked fabric of conditioned responses. Behaviorists tended to discuss psychological phenomena in terms of stimuli and responses, giving rise to the term stimulus response SR psychology. Note, however, that S. R. Psychology itself is not a theory or perspective but a set of terms that can be used to communicate psychological information. S. R. The terminology is still sometimes used in psychology today. Gestalt psychology. About 1912, at the same time, that behaviorism was catching on in the United States, Gestalt psychology was appearing in Germany. Gestalt is a German word meaning form or configuration, which referred to the approach taken by Max Wertheimer and his colleagues Kurt Kafka and Wolfgang Kuhler, all of whom eventually emigrated to the United States. The Gestalt psychologist's primary interest was the perception, and they believed that perceptual experiences depend on the patterns formed by stimuli and on the organization of experience. What we actually see is related to the background against which an object appears, as well as to other aspects of the overall pattern of stimulation, see Chapter 5. The whole is different from the sum of its parts because the whole depends on the relationships among the parts. Among the key interests of Gestalt psychologists were the perception of motion, how people judge size, and the appearance of colors under changes in illumination. These interests led them to a number of perception-centered interpretations of learning, memory, and problem-solving that helped lay the groundwork for current research in cognitive psychology. The Gestalt psychologists also influenced key founders of modern social psychology including Kurt Lewin, Solomon Ash, and Fritz Heider who expanded on Gestalt principles to understand interpersonal phenomena, Jones, 1998. For instance, Ash 1946 extended the Gestalt notion that people see whole rather than isolated parts from the simple case of object perception to the more complex case of person perception, Taylor, 1998. 
Plus, they saw the process of imposing meaning and structure on incoming stimuli as automatic and outside conscious awareness, a gestalt view that continues to infuse contemporary research on social cognition to this day. See Chapter 18, Moskowitz, Skernik, and Galinsky, 1999. Psychoanalysis Psychoanalysis is both a theory of personality and a method of psychotherapy originated by Sigmund Freud around the turn of the 20th century. At the center of Freud's theory is the concept of the unconscious the thoughts, attitudes, impulses, wishes, motivations, and emotions of which we are unaware. Freud believed that childhood's unacceptable, forbidden or punished, wishes are driven out of conscious awareness and become part of the unconscious, where they continue to influence our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Unconscious thoughts are expressed in dreams, slips of the tongue, and physical mannerisms. During therapy with patients, Freud used the method of free association, in which the patient was instructed to say whatever comes to mind as a way of bringing unconscious wishes into awareness. The analysis of dreams served the same purpose. In classical Freudian theory, the motivations behind unconscious wishes almost always involved sex or aggression. For this reason, Freud's theory was not widely accepted when it was first proposed. Contemporary psychologists do not accept Freud's theory in its entirety, but they tend to agree that people's ideas, goals, and motives can at times operate outside conscious awareness. Later Developments in 20th Century Psychology Despite the important contributions of Gestalt psychology and psychoanalysis, until World War II psychology was dominated by behaviorism, particularly in the United States. After the war, interest in psychology increased. Sophisticated instruments and electronic equipment became available, and a wider range of problems could be examined. It became evident that earlier theoretical approaches were too restrictive. This viewpoint was strengthened by the development of computers in the 1950s. Computers were able to perform tasks, such as playing chess and proving mathematical theorems that previously could be done only by human beings. They offered psychologists a powerful tool for theorizing about psychological processes. In a series of papers published in the late 1950s, Herbert Simon, who was later awarded a Nobel Prize, and his colleagues described how psychological phenomena could be simulated with a computer. Many psychological issues were recast in terms of information processing models, which viewed human beings as processors of information and provided a more dynamic approach to psychology than behaviorism. Similarly, the information processing approach made it possible to formulate some of the ideas of gestalt psychology and psychoanalysis more precisely. Earlier ideas about the nature of the mind could be expressed in concrete terms and checked against actual data. For example, we can think of the operation of memory as analogous to the way computer stores and retrieves information. Just as a computer can transfer information from temporary storage in its internal memory chips, RAM, to more permanent storage on the hard drive, so, our working memory can act as a two-way station to long-term memory, Atkinson and Schifrin, 1971A, Rymakers and Schifrin, 1992. Another important influence on psychology in the 1950s was the development of modern linguistics. Linguists began to theorize about the mental structures required to comprehend and speak a language. A pioneer in this area was Noam Chomsky, whose book Syntactic Structures, published in 1957, stimulated the first significant psychological analyses of language and the emergence of the field of psycholinguistics. At the same time, important advances were occurring in neuropsychology. Discoveries about the brain and nervous system revealed clear relationships between neurological events and mental processes. In recent decades, advances in biomedical technology have enabled rapid progress in research on these relationships. In 1981 Roger Sperry was awarded a Nobel Prize for demonstrating the links between specific regions of the brain and particular thought and behavioral processes, which we discuss in Chapter 2. The development of information processing models, psycholinguistics, and neuropsychology have produced an approach to psychology that is highly cognitive in orientation. Although its principal concern is the scientific analysis of mental processes and structures, cognitive psychology is not exclusively concerned with thought and knowledge. As illustrated throughout this book, this approach has been expanded to many other areas of psychology, including perception, motivation, emotion, clinical psychology, personality, and social psychology. In sum, during the 20th century, the focus of psychology came full circle. After rejecting conscious experiences ill-suited to scientific investigation and turning to the study of overt, observable behavior, psychologists are once again theorizing about covert aspects of the mind, this time with new and more powerful tools.